So I want to welcome everybody to the uh, this edition of the ACS Photonics Global Webinar Series. Uh, we have uh, two speakers today. Our featured speaker is uh, Dr. Arseny Kuznetsov, who's the um, head of the Depart uh, Department of Advanced Optical Technologies, uh, the uh, Institute for Materials Research and Engineering uh, of ASTAR in Singapore. Uh, and our uh, author speaker today is uh, uh, Professor Lei Shi, who is uh, from the Huazong University of Science and Technology. And uh, we're pleased to have uh, both uh, Arseny and uh, Lei here today with us to share uh, their research work, uh, which has uh, been, uh, some of which has been reported in ACS Photonics. And uh, uh, we'll begin uh, with a short discussion with uh, Arseny uh, to uh, talk a little bit about uh, his, uh, uh, as he comes to the seminar, um, his work in science and uh, his outlook on the uh, photonics field. Uh, so Arseny, maybe we could begin with uh, just a, a short uh, uh, introduction about, uh, you know, when you were, uh, I, I, when, when you were young, uh, what inspired you to get uh, into the field of science? Uh, how, how did you end up to a, going in a scientific direction? Well, uh, thank you for the introduction, first of all, Harry. So yeah, so for me, I think uh, I didn't have much choice because uh, my both uh, parents actually worked uh, in Russia in the scientific institute. My, my father was a scientist and uh, mother was an engineer. And uh, I think, yeah, so I just uh, followed this path. Okay, that we in uh, in the, the U.S. we would say you were an apple that did not fall far from the tree. In that exactly. case, uh, yeah, I would I had a similar fate. My father was a physics professor, so it seemed uh, sort of uh, fate has determined my uh, direction. Uh, so great, and uh, then you uh, did your early training, I guess, in in uh, in Russia, uh, and yes. Uh, uh, and then uh, you also made your way, you've, you've uh, interacted with uh, uh, people in uh, various parts of the world um, from uh, uh, also in Australia. Uh, and uh, then I, it was, I guess, in, uh, was it in 2010 or 2011 that you joined in uh, uh, A-STAR in Singapore? Yes, exactly. So uh, I actually uh, graduated uh, in Russia, but then I did my PhD, double PhD between France and uh, Russia. So traveling every half year back and forth was quite exciting time. Uh, then after that, I, I, I went to Germany actually for four years uh, doing okay. my uh, Humboldt Fellow postdoc. And then uh, I came actually to Singapore in uh, 2011. And since then, I kind of uh, stay there. Yeah, so... Uh... I guess uh, you know many in the photonics field know you as being a, a champion of uh, dielectric nano antennas and dielectric, and, and which blossomed into this whole field of dielectric metasurfaces. Uh, and uh, maybe tell us a little bit about that that at the beginning. I remember uh, in the beginning, uh, I don't think uh, at least I didn't have the feeling that this was going to turn into a huge enterprise uh, the way it has all worked out. And I, I wondered if you had it sort of all. Uh, sort of mapped out from the beginning or because it seemed like in the beginning you had focused very much on the fundamental scattering properties of dielectric uh, nano antennas, whereas now your work is also going in uh, directions that involve uh, some uh, interesting applications. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, the way we started was uh, quite uh, unusual. I mean, uh, or probably usual. So it was really uh, uh, just an occasion for us, a surprise to see these uh, scattering properties of silicon particles. Well, we were doing completely different experiment, uh, basically ablating some films on top of silicon wafers. And then looking at the microscope, I saw these very bright colors which comes out of the ablation process. So I start to study and realize these are silicon particles. And it was... Uh, I mean, quite exciting to see that strong resonances. So I knew about plasmonics, but uh, I didn't realize that actually dialectics can give you such a strong, uh, strong resonances. And yeah. uh, that was uh, the whole trigger for me to start uh, investigating it. And initially, uh, we thought, okay, there we, we were really surprised to see that strong also magnetic dipole response, which was not, yeah. you know, was difficult in plasmonics. So people right, didn't exactly. believe it, and at that time you can do it invisible. But with dialectics, it was uh, really exciting to see that you can have it uh, for the whole visible range. 
And uh, yeah, little by little, we start first with investigating fundamental things, so scattering, showing that we can control radiation, small antennas, and then it went uh, more and more and more, so metasurfaces field uh, came in and uh, a lot of things, and actually now I would say we are much more towards applications of, of uh, these uh, non-antennas rather than fundamentals, because I think uh, more or less fundamentals are known, but what we are really pushing for is to bring this new ideas towards uh, towards industry towards, towards applications. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, and so maybe you could uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, uh, well, maybe uh, uh, what what life was like in normal times before the pandemic uh, in your daily life. Is, is your, your I guess your laboratory is located in uh, an urban area in Singapore. But it's also co-located with other uh, laboratories, and uh, it's uh, uh, it, maybe you can s describe a little bit for the you know for the audience just the, what the environment is like. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, so uh, my uh, department is a part of the institute, Institute of Materials Research of Engineer and Engineering, and this part, institute is a part of ASTA. So it's, it's a huge organization. I mean, Singapore scale is huge. I think it's around five thousand people working in it, and around twenty different institutes. So, um, and all these institutes are actually co-located more or less in the same area. So we have really a lot of science going on. And our institute, for example, is just located on one floor of large, uh, very modern building where we moved uh, three, four years ago. And uh, our institutes are located just next floor. So we actually have possibility to interact uh, a lot with, uh, with our researchers from our places I and mean, in our institutes in Singapore. We have joint clean rooms also. I mean, it's it's quite a nice facility here. Plus we also have some kind of startup uh, campus nearby. So I think uh, they try to create this environment that you already naturally have in uh, in California, right? Where yeah. companies and, and the researchers uh, together trying to interact and try to solve joint problems. Okay, great. Um and so maybe you could uh, give us a little bit of an uh, uh, idea of some, what you think are some of the, ex, uh, what we will hear in your talk, of course, but what you see as being some of the really exciting future directions for the field of photonics as a whole. Oh, well, for the field of photonics. Well, I hear I can be a little bit biased, I think, because uh, there are some directions which I really like and uh, I, I push them forward. So I think uh, there are many uh, very exciting applications of photonics technologies uh, which are coming. So both which I like uh, the most and some of them I think you will share uh, uh, this <laughs> with me uh, uh, related to, for example, uh, uh, lighters for autonomous vehicles, right? This is something that should come quite soon and will be really big technologies. Uh, of the future. Next, a little bit farther apart is uh, all this uh, augmented virtual reality and holographic displays. Yeah. I mean, augmented and virtual reality are already there in, in some sort of devices, but not uh, yet um, very convenient and not yet very good. But uh, when holographic displays come, that will be really a, a huge uh, transformation for, for the whole industry. Right, because yeah. you imagine if you start seeing your images in 3D and interact with images in 3D, that becomes completely different way how we interact with information. Uh, yeah. That's what uh, that's what I really like. But of course, I mean there are a lot of other fields like sensing, uh, space, uh, telecommunications. Uh, that's yeah. just not something what we are working on right now. Okay, great. And then finally. Uh, Maybe you could tell us uh, if you had to uh, give your former self or maybe a, a, a student or a young researcher entering the field advice uh, about directions to pursue and things to do, what, what would that advice be? <clears throat> yeah, so I think um, uh, looking at my path, right? So, and uh, to reach in uh, something uh, requires a lot of search and a lot of curiosity. So you really should not be uh, stubborn uh, into one direction and look for, for things which you like, look for things where you can bring impact. For myself, I, I changed quite a number of uh, directions, everything within photonics, but in many uh, different areas, starting from some theory of laser matter interactions, femtosecond laser, physics, experimental, then uh, I don't know, melting of film films, a lot of stuff before I came to the area uh, where I work now. And uh, that's what I would advise people, just uh, stay curious and find something what you like the most and uh, put your best effort to develop it. Okay, well, I think that's uh, that sounds like very good advice, yeah. 
Okay, so I think what we can do now is uh, go ahead and get started. So as I mentioned, Arti Arseny is a principal scientist and a department head of the Advanced Optical Technologies Department at uh, IMRE. And today he's gonna to be sharing with us uh, his uh, uh, outlook and uh, research activities on active and tunable dielectric nano antennas and metasurfaces. So Arseny, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Can you see my slides? Yeah, looks very clear. Okay, okay, very good. So hello everyone, whatever it is evening or morning for you. So it's morning in Singapore for sure. So here's my talk here. So I, I will be talking about our work on active and tunable uh, dielectric metasurfaces, and uh, this is the outline. So I will start with some brief introduction into the concept of dielectric nano antennas and metasurfaces if, if it's new field for you. Uh, then I will be talking about some flat optics uh, based on dielectric nano antennas, in particular high NA and large field of view flat lenses, which we are working on. The next topic will be active dielectric and metasurfaces. And in particular, I will be introducing lasers, which are based on nano lasers, which are based on this concept of nano antennas. And finally, I will finalize with tunable uh, nano antennas, which uh, brings us to the concept of special light modulators and holographic displays. So let me start with introduction. Uh, of course, all of you know that conventional optics is based on uh, conventional optical elements such as lenses. And you probably also know that lens to focus light requires certain volume of material. So it's a bulk optical component. Basically light needs to propagate inside this lens to accumulate certain phase delay to then be able to focus. And this actually a standard principle, uh, but at the same time, it also provides limitations. For example, if we would like to shrink our lens uh, to small sizes and integrate it, for example, inside a smartphone or any mobile device, then we experience some problems because lenses are always bulk and we cannot really uh, change much with it. And that's why, for example, in smartphone cameras, you always have a protruding uh, lens model just because you need to integrate many lenses there and each lens uh, requires space and it uh, requires some weight. That's why actually now uh, the whole scientific, I mean, the big scientific community is working on the completely new approach to, to optical elements, which is called flat optics or metasurfaces. So basically, instead of using lenses to control light, what is proposed is to use such kind of arrays of nanostructures, which are called nano antennas. And each of these nano antennas can control light locally and create a wavefront of light, which we want. So how does that work? It's actually analogous to antennas, which we all know from radio frequencies. So you probably remember from school that antenna is actually a resonant device which can control radio frequencies. It can emit, it can collect, it can control the phase, it can do whatever we want. But what is important because of the resonance, actually antenna size can be quite small and potentially can be even smaller than the length of your radio frequencies. So now radio frequencies is electromag are electromagnetic waves, same as light. So the question is, can we use the same concept of antennas at light frequencies? So yes, the answer is yes, because Maxwell equations are scalable, but the only trick here is actually that light wavelength is million times smaller than the wavelength of radio frequencies. So in order to have this antenna at working for light, what we need to do is shrink down the size of this antenna million times and go down to dimensions of approximately few hundred nanometers. And then in principle, we have, can have a device which will perform a similar function as this antenna uh, perform for radio frequencies. And this is called nano antennas, just because it's antenna and it has uh, nano, nano, nanometer scales. Basically, this is an antennas for light. And now what we do here, we place an array of such antennas. And when we shine light on it, shine light on it, each antenna can control uh, the interaction with light and basically can change the phase or potentially amplitude of light in the way we want it. And then we can create any wavefront we want and we can focus light, for example, we can generate hologram, we can do whatever we want with light with just a thin layer of nanostructures, which can be as thin as a few hundred nanometers only. And that's uh, the key thing of the flat optics, uh, which uh, we are now working on. So initially, these antennas actually were based on uh, metallic structures. And here, of course, exists analogy with uh, radio frequencies, where also antennas are made out of metal. And uh, in the field of optics, they also were made of metal, 
such as plasmonic particles, for example, gold and silver. And the reason why uh, people use plasmonic is, of course, because plasmonic particles might have strong resonant behavior at optical frequencies. You, for example, can have electric uh, dipole behavior, like in a sphere. You can also obtain magnetic dipole behavior in a split ring, and this is the basis of uh, metamaterials field. But the problem here, which appears in this case, is that actually um, metals at optical frequencies are not as good as they are at radio frequencies. Actually, they always have losses, which at radius frequencies they don't have. So basically, whenever we excite these resonances in a sphere, on the, in a split ring, we have a free electrons moving inside, and these free electrons lead to resonantly enhanced ohmic losses. So whenever we have resonances inside particles, metallic particles, we also have resonantly enhanced ohmic losses. And this is significant problems when we come to applications of, of, of such kind of concepts. That's why our group and also many other groups around the world, I actually start working on completely new direction uh, on the, of non-antennas, basically making non-antennas not out of met met metals, plasmonic metals, but out of high refractive index dialectics. And this actually can be shown that if your uh, refractive index of your dialectic is sufficiently high, then let's say more than two or more than three, and you make a particle, out of this dialectic, then this particle can work as an efficient resonator, which can trap light inside and basically demonstrate resonance scattering behavior very similar to what plasmonic particles can give you. In fact, a single dialectic sphere can provide you both electric and magnetic dipole resonance. And this is shown here. This is just a very simple calculations using me theory. This is the scattering in uh, silver, gold, and silicon particles. Silver and gold are plasmonic particles, and silicon represents dialectics here. So you may see when particles are very small, then uh, silver probably has still the best scattering. But once we increase the particle size a little bit, just to 100 or 150 nanometers, you may see that resonances in silicon particles become stronger than in plasmonic particles. And also they have higher quality factor. And this actually demonstrates the fact that silicon has much lower losses than plasmonic metals, even in visible spectral range. And actually it has zero losses in near infrared, but even in visible, it's actually better uh, than plasmonic metals. And also you may see that you can actually tune the position of resonances just by changing particle size. Yeah, you see from 100 to 200 nanometers, you can tune resonances through the whole visible. And also what is actually also important is that in silicon particles, you also always have two resonances. The biggest one here, this large resonance, first resonance, is actually magnetic dipole resonance. And this is electric dipole resonance. And this is another feature of dielectric particles. You can have both resonant magnetic and electric response, not something what you can get in simple uh, metallic spheres. Uh, for those of you who have worked in the field, I, I like to show this picture. It's our first experimental demonstration of these particles. And what you see here is just a silicon wafer, which we ablated with femtosecond laser. And then we look at it uh, at the ductile microscope. So you see all these beautiful colors here actually correspond to silicon nanoparticles, which are generated uh, during this ablation process. And uh, then back in 2012, we studied this process and you see we found that particles of the size of 100 nanometers have this nice blue color and actually magnetic dipole resonance in the blue spectral range. And then by changing the particle size from 100 to 200 nanometers, you can actually tune the resonances of silicon particles through the whole visible spectrum. As I said, these results were published back in 2012 and it was first demonstration of resonant behavior of these dialectic nanoantennas. But very fast, uh, people understand that actually this ablation process or making spherical particle is not needed to obtain this resonant behavior. What you need is just to have some particles. For example, you can have disks which can be produced by standard lithographic techniques. So in just a few years after this demonstration, people already could fabricate very complex non-antenna structures performing different uh, uh, complex functions. And that's quite important because actually silicon is a very well known and very well developed material in uh, semiconductor industry. So you basically can use standard semiconductor processes now to fabricate these antennas and control your light in the way you want. And this is a serious advantage of this dielectric non-antenna approach. So I will not go much into details of, of the history of that field, but if you're interested, we have this review uh, published back in 2016, which I think represent very nicely on uh, what has been done uh, in this field uh, by in the beginning. And uh, I would like just highlight three major advantages which uh, dielectric nanoparticles and dielectric nanoantennas bring uh, to the field of nanophotonics compared to plasmonics. So first of all, it's low losses, which I already mentioned. Second one is nanofabrication friendly materials, such as CMOS compatible silicon, for example. So you can really use standard industrial processes to fabricate these antennas. 
And finally, last but not the least, is a strong magnetic dipole response, which is something what plasmonic particles either don't have or it's difficult uh, to get the strong magnetic dipole. Okay, let me now give you a few examples on what kind of optical components we can do using these dielectric nano antennas and metasurfaces. And I decided just to show you two examples here, which are related to lenses, because you know lenses is actually the key component which is needed for optical devices. And here we demonstrated that actually lenses which are made out of dielectric nano antennas can actually overperform conventional bulk lenses. And here, for example, we demonstrate a high numerical aperture lens. And uh, those of you who work in microscopy or in general in optics, you should know that actually this numerical aperture is a very important parameter. It basically shows how tight you can focus your light with your lens or objective, and also how many angles you can collect from a point emitter. Right, so basically that's one of the key parameters which characterize uh, optical lenses. And typical microscope objective, so the best microscope objective you can find uh, in the market will have numerical aperture of 0 0.9, which corresponds to theta of uh, 64 degrees. So I think somewhere you can find 0 0.95, but it would be uh, quite rare. So what we have shown that using these dielectric nano antennas and uh, flat optics, so basically meta surfaces based on these dielectric nano antennas, we are able to produce a flat lens, oh sorry, uh, which has numerical aperture of 0 0.99. So with basically with a theoretical limit of unity. So what does that mean? That means that this lens can collect angle and focus angle all the way up to 82 degrees. So this is significant improvement compared to commercial microscope objective. And at the same time, this lens actually can be very thin so it can be very cheap because we can use semiconductor mass production to manufacture it. And it's just a single layer of nanostructures, but still it has a numerical aperture significantly higher than the most expensive and bulky uh, microscope objective. And here you may see just example of imaging with such kind of lens with the commercial, uh, commercial microscope objective. So we do here uh, confocal imaging of uh, some small um, uh, nanodiamonds with uh, nitrogen vacancies inside. And this is basically just a point source. So you may see this is a point spread function which we obtain using commercial objective. And this is a point spread function which we obtain using flat lens. And you may see that actually it's small, it's significantly smaller. So we actually have a significantly uh, higher resolution with this lens than commercial uh, microscope objective. So the second example I would like to give you is related to large field of view optics and large field of view lens. Again, people who are interested in photography probably know that such kind of lenses allows you to really produce nice images with very large uh, field of view. But in order to do it, you basically need to use that kind of very bulky assemblies, which are, call it, which are called fisheye lenses. And basically, it's not a single lens. It's just the assembly of many lenses put together, which allows you to enhance uh, your field of view. And this is called a fisheye lens. So what we have shown that actually using the standard flat lens based on the single layer of nanostructures, it's possible actually perform a very similar function. And you may see it lens here. So we used again, a lithographic technique, con conventional uh, uh, industry grade technique to produce these lenses at wafer scale. And uh, you may see here the performance of this lens. So uh, what you uh, hear is a schematic of our experiment. So we have a small lens here, just a half millimeter inside. And it's located two centimeters away from a large ruler, which has uh, 15 uh, centimeters here. And this is the actual image, which we can see in our detector uh, using this lens. And you may see almost all the ruler can be actually imaged with this lens. Of course, it becomes more and more uh, compressed here, but this is normal, this is a barrel distortion, something that you always get uh, for, for wide field of view imaging. And we can go all the way easily, all the way up to 120 degrees with this uh, small lens. And recently we used this actually this kind of lenses to, for example, create a, a fingerprint imaging device. So for fingerprint, you know, you need to be able to read out your fingerprint at very small distance. So here we located our lens two millimeters away from our fingerprint and the lens will have a size again of only a few hundred micrometers. And even though it was so small and just two millimeters away, it could easily image uh, the whole fingerprint. And basically I think these kind of lenses have a lot of potential for applications uh, in mobile devices. In any case, just these two examples, what I showed you just here to demonstrate that flat optics is not just a substitute for uh, conventional optics to create the same functions, but actually it also can create some enhanced functions, something what conventional optics cannot do, but nano antennas can. Uh, let me now move to my second part of my talk, which is related to active uh, nano antennas and active devices. 
So what do I mean by active? It's actually nanoantennas which are based on active light emitting materials. So before uh, the nanoantennas which I showed you in metasurfaces were actually were made out of passive materials such as uh, silicon, titanium dioxide, and so on. And these uh, uh, nanoantennas were used to control the phase and amplitude of light. So here the idea is the following: that uh, what we need to create an antenna, we need actually some high refractive index material. And we know that actually a lot, a broad class of materials can be used. For example, we can use free five materials, which are also known for their light emission. So the idea is what is happening now if we create nano antennas of this light emitting material? Then in principle, we can create light sources which we can control using nano antenna resonances. So basically, if we arrange nano antennas in particular fashion, we can create, for example, laser, which directivity of emission will be controlled by the nano antennas. And that was our initial idea. I would like also to say that actually uh, first 3.5 nano antennas were used uh, for nonlinear processes because also 3.5 uh, materials are known uh, to have strong nonlinearities and here are a few examples on this slide. But uh, before we start, actually, there were no examples of using nano antennas for, for light emission. So we decided, we decided to start with some first and quite simple demonstrations. So we decided to create a laser which is based on such kind of uh, two-dimensional arrays of nano antennas. And in order to do so, we basically use the gallium arsenide on quartz platform. So what we have here is gallium arsenide nanopillars, which has a size of only 100 nanometers, which are located on top of a quartz substrate. And we arrange these uh, gallium arsenide pillars in a way to get high quality factor resonances related to bound states in the continuum. Uh, let me explain you what is that. So typically bound state is just a particular uh, state within a continuum of state, which for some symmetry reasons, for example, can have a very high or even infinite quality Q factor. And this happens because in this particular state, actually system, again, due to the symmetry, doesn't have any open radiative channel. So uh, let me show you how it actually can work in such kind of simple two-dimensional array of nanopillars. So let's consider a subdiffractive array of pillars. And let's say each of the pillars would support only single dipole resonance. And now for the laser mode, let's consider a mode where all these dipoles are actually incited in phase, right? So since all the dipoles are in phase, and this is a subdiffractive array, then the only direction where this kind of array can emit in is actually uh, will be perpendicular to the array. Yes, so top and bottom in this image, because all the other directions will be canceled by the neighboring dipoles. This is uh, quite obvious. So now, if our dipoles are horizontally oriented, then everything is normal. We know that dipoles can emit vertically and array can emit vertically, so we will have array emitting in vertical direction. So now, but what happens if our dipoles are oriented vertically here? We know that vertical dipoles cannot emit in direction of their orientation, so they cannot emit vertically. But the array itself cannot emit in any other direction but vertical. So we have very strange situation that actually all the dipoles are excited, the system is excited, but there is no any direction where it can emit. So there is no any open uh, emission channel. And this creates this kind of bound state in the continuum, which potentially in theory for uh, infinite array can have an infinite uh, quality factor. So we decided to create this kind of array based on our uh, dialectic nanopillars. Uh, but of course, we should remember that in real situation, array will not be infinite. So emission will happen somewhere from the uh, sides of the array, or it happens on some defects and so on. That's why we would like to make this process more controlled. So what we have done, we actually, by, uh, by hands, we opened a radiation channel for this system, a weak radiation channel, which will allow our laser to outcouple where we want it to outcouple. And how to do it, we just change the period of this array in one direction to make it slightly diffractive, right? So diffraction order close to the normal. And then we know that actually laser light will go towards this uh, diffraction direction because this is still very high quality factor, but still it's an open, an open channel. Basically, it's called a super cavity motor broken, uh, broken VIC. So let's see how it looks in experiment. This is our array. Uh, what you can see here is actually transmission spectrum, angular resolved transmission. Uh, this is experiment with simulations. So you see the good correlation here. And uh, there are two modes which we observe inside this array. So one mode behaves quite normally. So it basically changes slightly with the angle. And uh, the other mode actually is quite interesting. So you may see when we start to approach normal incidence, the mode became narrower and then it disappears. So at normal incidence, there is no mode anymore. But then we go again and then it starts again to appear, right? And start to broaden. 
And if we analyze now with multiple decomposition, what these modes correspond to, we can see that actually this bottom mode correspond to horizontal electric dipole. So exactly those which can emit uh, in the vertical direction. And the top mode correspond to vertical magnetic uh, electric dipoles. And that's exactly the bound state in the continuum. So basically you may see because they are vertical here for normal incidence, you cannot couple uh, to, to, to the system anymore. And it has an infinite Q factor. And indeed, when we measure experimentally the quality factor of this mode from here, you may see that it start to grow at normal incidence and basically then reach the detection limit quite fast when it approach uh, the normal incidence. So it's a proper, proper bound state in the continuum. Now what we need to do with the system is just to pump it. So what we did here, we uh, put our array into cryostat and go down to 77 Kelvin. And also we pumped it with a femtosecond laser. So why we cooled it down is because gallium arsenide, which we used is not really a good gain medium at room temperature. So you need to cool it down. And then in this case, you can improve uh, the gain properties. So what happens when we pump it? First, at low intensities, you may see this is a spontaneous emission, quite broad spectrum. But once we reach certain threshold around 10 microjoule per square centimeter, we start to get narrow, narrow emission peak here. And then you just a little bit increase the pumping energy and this peak uh, start to amplify very, very fast and growing very, very fast. And basically, you may see that uh, full width of how much simum changes abruptly in this position. And also, if you record the standard SQF, so basically log-log scale uh, uh, of emission versus uh, pump uh, intensities, you basically may see that in indeed represent the SQF, which uh, shows the transition from spontaneous emission to amplified spontaneous emission, and then to the lasing regime. So this is a clear, clear lasing behavior. It's also interesting to see how the actually emission pattern look like. So here, what you can see this is the back focal plane imaging. So it's a k-vector uh, space of, of the emission. And you may see that before the lasing, it's quite a broad angular emission, which would correspond to this kind of modes to which we couple. But once we reach the lasing, all the lights start to concentrate only two points here, which basically correspond to two directions uh, to, uh, corresponding to the open uh, diffraction order, uh, which we have in our system. And that's, uh, again, very clear demonstration of directional lasing uh, using these nano antennas. So these results we published back in 2018. And uh, then we thought, OK, so uh, to make it practical, actually, we need to have some kind of more, uh, more efficient emission system because gallium arsenide is not really efficient and you need to cool it down. So how to make a laser which would release, for example, at room temperature? And so we decided to switch from gallium arsenide to more efficient uh, emitters, such as quantum dots or nanoplatelets, which was specifically designed to have an efficient amplified spontaneous emission. But of course, in this case, it's quite difficult to pattern uh, nanodots or, or nanoplatelets. So what we have done, we created an array of nanoantennas, which are passive. In this case, these are based on titanium dioxide. And then we surround it with nanoantennas with a gain medium, with quantum dots or, or, in, or with uh, nanoplatelets. And then basically when they pump it, then this nanoplatelet emits, and then they couple to the BIC modes uh, of the array. And again, this is experiment simulations. You may see again, we have this reflection in this case. You may see this nice uh, modes of the system, which we detect again using our uh, spectral result back focal plane imaging. And you may see that again, here we have this mode which disappears once it approaches uh, the normal incidence. It, it's the same image as before, just rotated uh, 90 degrees. So you may see a very similar behavior here. And if we analyze again uh, the modes which are excited in the system, we may see that actually this mode correspond to vertical magnetic uh, dipole in this case, uh, in the case of titanium dioxide particles. Then what we do, we start pumping it again with femtosecond laser, but now at room temperature. And what we observe, this is the back focal plane. So basically the k-vector plane of emission. And this is spectral resolved back focal plane. So at low intensities again, so emission corresponds to certain uh, diffraction lines, which are normal for this system. But once we reach certain threshold, we start to see that very nice tiny donut in between close to a normal incidence. So why it is donut? Because at bound states, you cannot emit exactly at normal incidence. But system try to emit very close to normal incidence, because that's where you have already uh, some open radiation channel, but quality factor is still very, very high. And that's why you are starting getting this donut. And basically, you increase your uh, uh, pumping intensity a little bit, and this donut becomes much more intense than anything around, and basically much more intense than any spontaneous emission. And this is our laser emission here. Again, we can study, you may see how this narrow peak appears at, at the uh, lasing threshold. And you may see the clear transition from the uh, spontaneous emission to amplified spontaneous emission and lasing uh, in, in this system. 
Again, so the key result here is that we finally could do it with uh, none of, first, of, first of all, quantum dots, and second, we can also uh, do it at room temperature. So the next uh, the next step for us is now to switch from femtosecond laser to nanosecond or to actually we did already for nanosecond but to uh, cw laser then to potentially go to electrically pumped lasers which are based uh, on this concept so uh, i would like also to mention that apart from two-dimensional array we studied also different systems for example this one-dimensional chain of gallium arsenide nano antennas and in this case we didn't use bound state but we use instead uh, this low light mode inside this kind of chain uh, of dielectric nano antennas and basically what happens is that when light is emitted it slowly propagates inside this basically with low velocity propagate inside this chain then it reflects quite efficiently from the end of the chain propagates back and so on and so on finally forming the mode uh, inside this kind of chain of nanoparticles and it can be shown actually that this mode actually can have because it's a slow light mode it can have a very high quality factor of the order of uh, 10 to 4 in a system of just 100 particles and uh, uh, what is also important about this system is that actually the emission of the system will be the parallel to the chain and this can be quite useful for for example light on chip integration so these kind of lasers would be nice directional on chip lasers Again, so we performed the proof of concept demonstration of such kind of laser system. So you may see this is uh, gallium arsenide nanoparticles put together. And uh, the, this is how the chain look like. And then when we start pumping the system, then when we reach a certain threshold, there is a narrow peak which start to appear and grow very fast, uh, demonstrating the lazy behavior. Again, uh, this is the S curve, so log log scale uh, curve of emission versus pump. And you may see a clear transition from spontaneous to amplified spontaneous and then uh, to lazy emission. So again, this was very nice demonstration for in-plane uh, emitting lasers. And finally, uh, just to finish that part, we also demonstrated lasers which are actually based just on single particles. So ultimately small lasers which are based on dielectric nano antennas. And you know, for before, uh, people also tried to do uh, lasers based on single cylinder, but they were using just simple me modes. And that's why they could not, uh, uh, basically, the whispering modes, and they could not shrink the size of this disk to very small dimensions. So here we have shown that if you use a bound state in the continuum in a single particle, which actually is formed by the interference of me mode with the fabri mode in the disk. So me mode is the one propagating in this circumference and fabri mode, which is propagating in this direction. And these two modes interfering together can actually cancel each other in the path field and create this kind of quasi bound state or super cavity mode in a single nanoparticle. This actually, uh, this work, uh, uh, for, uh, the work which was proposing this concept first was uh, from the group of Yuri Kipshai. So what we have done, we adapted these uh, uh, modes to our gallium arsenide cylinders, and we indeed have shown that we can obtain very high quality factor for uh, azimuthal mode number three, so me mode number three inside the cylinder. I think this is the smallest mode uh, which was demonstrated for lasing so far. So far, and this is actually our experiment. So this is standard gallium arsenide cylinder with a size of only 500 nanometers stain on top of quartz substrate. So no undercut, nothing. And when we pump it, we can very clearly obtain the lazing behavior from this uh, cylinder. And I think until now, this is the smallest uh, 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 purely semiconductor laser, which is demonstrated so far. And we could achieve this smallest purely semiconductor laser without any plasmonics using this bound states in the continuum in a single particle. Okay, so uh, let me now switch to the last part of my talk. I don't have that much time. So, um, and talk a little bit about tunable nano optics and tunable nano antennas. So, what I was talking about before was basically passive nano antennas, which can control the phase and amplitude of light, then light emitting nano antennas. And now I will be talking about nano antennas, which can dynamically tune, for example, dynamically control their phase uh, and uh, that they bring to light. So why is it important? You probably know that one of the key applications uh, of photonic technologies in the future will be in a new type of displays, so-called augmented and virtual reality devices, as well as holographic displays, which I mentioned uh, before my talk. And basically, once these technologies are developed, they will completely change the way how they receive and how we interact with information. And in order to obtain this kind of uh, uh, control or movable holograms, what we need to do, we need to dynamically control the wavefront of light. And for that, we need to use devices which are called special light modulators. And these are the two state-of-the-art special light modulators uh, uh, which are existing on the market. One can control uh, 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 intensity from Texas instruments, and one can control phase. This is from, uh, from whole eye. 
So the problem with these special modulators is that technologies which are used to produce them does not allow to shrink uh, the size of the pixel to very small dimensions. So the smallest pixel size which exists now is of the order of three micrometers for this device. And if you may see how it actually develops, you may see that uh, from 2002 to 2013, uh, it was actually the effort to reduce the pixel size of special light modulator, but the smallest they can achieve was a word of 3.7 microns. And until now, in 2020, still the smallest pixel size is above 3 micrometers. And actually the pixel size limits the resolution of hologram and also the field of view. And actually this is a significant technological limitation to produce a holographic display. So now, uh, why basically they cannot achieve smaller pixel size? The reason is not engineering constraint, because at the moment, uh, I mean, silicon industry can do much smaller sizes than that. So what is the actual reason? The reason is that these technologies are still based on conventional optical elements, on conventional mirrors, for example. And uh, you might remember that actually mirrors uh, can only be efficient and their size is much smaller than Wemlov. And here we already reach three micrometers, which just become comparable to Wemlov of light, which is of the order of half or one micrometer. So basically that means that these technologies as they are now, they have their fundamental limitations. So they can never go to sizes equal to Wemlov or below Wemlov. There are also other, other, other constraints such as crosstalk between the pixels, for example, for liquid crystal devices. So how to solve this problem? Again, we need to come back to our idea of non-antennas. And we know that non-antenna can be smaller than Wemlof of light, and it can control amplitude and phase of light if you want, right? But what we need to do, we need to dynamically tune them now. So we basically need to uh, control uh, contact by electrical voltages, each of our non-antennas, and then by applying electrical voltage, change the phase, which is non antenna brings to light. And then in this case, we will be able to create a special light modulator, which basically will have a sub of pixel size and can dynamically control and create dynamic hologram. So in order to do it, we actually use the liquid crystal uh, platform. And why we use liquid crystals? Because they are actually very well developed for uh, display industry, and this is a big advantage. And what we do, we basically uh, embed our nano antennas inside liquid crystal. And when we apply voltage to this liquid crystal cell, we can tune the liquid crystal orientation. And by tuning liquid crystal orientation, we change refractive index. And thus, we can tune the position of resonance of nano antennas. And when we tune the resonance of nano antennas, we can tune the phase which this nano antenna brings to light. And importantly here, the difference of this device to conventional SLM is that these nano antennas allow to control the phase in just a very tiny layer here. So we don't need the thick layer of liquid crystal to control the phase. And by that, we can actually shrink down uh, the uh, thickness of the liquid crystal cell and uh, we can avoid the crosstalk between the pixels. And this also allows us to reduce uh, the pixel size of this device. And uh, in order to do it, we have a big program in Singapore and uh, Einstein universities and actually a collaboration of multiple groups. And the goal of this program is actually exactly development of such kind of special light modulated devices and integration and demonstration of them in AR and uh, holographic display uh, technologies. So let me just show you a few first results which were achieved in this program. And uh, first of them, for example, was published in Science uh, in 2019. And this is the first proof of concept demonstration of such kind of special light modulator. So what you can see here is actually a device which has 28 individually controlled electrodes and nano antennas are integrated on top. And uh, of course, then this is all embedded in liquid crystal and uh, as I showed in the previous schematics. So now when we start to apply voltages to these electrodes, individual voltages in different combinations, we can change the phase and we can inscribe certain phase profile onto these electrodes. And here, for example, we show you several configurations when we apply different voltages, uh, 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 different colors correspond to three different levels uh, of voltages we apply. And you may see by changing these configurations, we actually can change the phase gradient, which uh, this uh, uh, nano antenna array bring to light. And by that, we can tune uh, the diffraction of light, right? So basically, we can tune the position of this first diffraction order. And basically what happens now by applying different voltages, we can basically steer the laser beam, right? And this can be done very fast. So by applying different voltage configuration to these electrodes, we can dynamically steer the uh, laser beam of uh, transmitted beam. And this is done without any movable parts. And I would like to say, of course, it's not a holographic display yet, but already this device already has some applications, for example, for LiDAR technologies. And you know that LiDAR is probably one of the key technologies which is awaited for autonomous uh, car industry. And basically it's, 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 it, it will be used as one kind of 
uh, eyes of the car. And what is required for this slider technology is exactly to do the active scanning around the car without any movable parts. At the moment, uh, they use movable parts, but it's not reliable, it's bulky. But if we can create a device which can do it without a movable parts, that would be really uh, important for, for this industry. Okay, but of course, uh, our main goal is still a uh, holographic display and uh, we are working towards that direction and here you may see our first uh, device demonstration. So basically, this is a 32 by 32 uh, array of electrodes, two dimensional array of electrodes, each of them is controlled individually. And you may see this is white color here, a uh, big white color is uh, is an uh, electrode. And on top, the small circles, these are the nano antennas which we integrated on top. So, and these devices are already uh, currently under testing uh, in our lab. And just before the end, I would like also to show how we would like to do this holographic display and why is it important. So basically, as I mentioned already, holographic displays, we will be able to project the three dimensional holograms to your eyes. But you also know that if you go now to the modern movie, you basically can see three dimensional movies already now. But the difference is that current three dimensional movies, they are based on stereoscopic effect. So basically what happens is you get two separate images to your two separate eyes. And these images, they don't really have a real depth. And that's what creates uh, some uh, um, fuzziness to, to your brain. Basically, OK, you trick your brain, but then it starts to feel that something is wrong. Because there's you see the uh, depth on one hand, but there is no real depth. So if you close one eye, you will not be able to see the depth of the image. And uh, this is what is called virgins and accommodation conflict, as well as one of the main issues with current uh, stereoscopic technologies. So the difference in, in uh, holographic displays, and in this case, your hologram will be really 3D. So you can close one eye and you will still be able to see the free, free, real three-dimensional objects. So this is a true uh, three-dimensional objects which is created. And uh, uh, to show that, we actually did this kind of uh, um, interesting demonstration. So we fabricated a hologram which has a size of four by four millimeters. Again, this was done using a 12-inch photolithography on a large 12-inch uh, uh, scale. And then uh, we, we uh, put this hologram in the holographic display configuration. And this is what's shown in this movie. So what you see here is hologram, which you can see by your eye, basically now all up. And in this case, it's recorded by, by a single camera. And it has three parts. So it has this NTU logger, uh, which is located two meters away. Uh, uh, these dice, which is located in the middle. And this A-star logger, which is located here nearby this airplane. And now we are changing focus of our camera. Now you see we are uh, uh, at this helicopter, we have an A-star logger, then we move uh, farther away, we will have a dice. And far, finally, when we move far away apart, two meters away, we will have this NTU logger projected. So this is a true hologram and you can even move left and right your eyes and you may see that these three images are actually located on different uh, depths uh, uh, inside, inside this image. Okay, and of course, uh, this is just a static hologram which we created using just nanofabrication. But what we need to do in the future is to create a tunable hologram and integrate in the same configuration, and then we will have a three dimensional holographic display. I think with that, uh, I would like to finish and to open the floor for questions. Uh, I just uh, the last few things to say is yeah, if you are interested in the topic, we just published recently a new review on active and tunable nanophotonics with dielectric nano antennas. Please. Uh, have a look at it. So it's in proceedings of a triple E. And I would like to acknowledge my team in uh, A star or nanophotonics team. It's actually consists of multiple young people of nine different nationalities. And if uh, young scientists among you are interested to join us, we actually always have some opportunities. Please approach me. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Arseny, for this really uh, exciting introduction to not only the uh, basic science, but also the potential uh, in, in uh, applications for dielectric nano antennas. I think that uh, was uh, uh, resoundingly clear from your lecture today. Uh, so uh, a couple of uh, questions here, one, one of which had to do with the, um, uh, in, in the case where you have a, a dielectric nano antenna, uh, high refractive index is a valuable uh, uh, tool for the photonic design because it allows you to achieve resonances in small particles. Uh, and yet we also want materials that are uh, for visible light optics that are transparent throughout the visible region. And I noticed that, for example, uh, in the case for the uh, uh, quantum dots coupled to uh, titanium dioxide, the titanium dioxide is a rather lower index material, say, than uh, gallium arsenide, for example. Uh, so in that case, were the, were the modes, the horizontal and vertical modes, 
different or were the resonators larger? How, how, did, how did you do, how, how was the design achieved uh, for those lower index uh, resonators? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, first of all, I think uh, titanium dioxide is still considered a large enough uh, refractive index to obtain uh, resonances. So it's above two. I would say the critical uh, level is around two. Well, I mean, below two, probably 1.9 still possible something, but below that it becomes really difficult uh, to achieve good resonances inside the particles. So titanium dioxide have around 2.4. So it's still uh, quite comfortable uh, to work with. But of course, here yeah, you're right. So to uh, resonances, we scale with refractive index. So it's lambda over n. You have the first yeah. resonance. So basically what you need to do is to take a little bit slightly bigger particles. Of course, also when you reduce refractive index, they become more interactions uh, between the particles, which right. you need to be taken into account. But in these particular arrays, it was even good for us because it's these interactions which helped us to create these uh, bound states uh, in the continuum. Okay, so yeah. It's kind of hybrid between the array effect and the single particle uh, resonance. Yeah. Uh, and I guess... Uh, Another question uh, you, that I, I have, because of course I also share the interest in this area too, uh, that people always ask me, which is uh, you showed a beautiful demonstration uh, at the end of a um, active array. Uh, people always are asking me about, uh, is the wiring of all of these individual elements going to be a challenge? And I know uh, one of the element, uh, one of the, uh, uh, key aspects of your project is actually some of the engineering aspects. And I was just wondering whether you foresaw that that was going to end up being a, uh, uh, a, a challenge in, in, the long, in the long run, or whether it's sort of more an optics challenge. I guess what, what part of the technology is it going to end up being the biggest challenge? So uh, uh, this is a quite big project which uh, has several challenges inside. So of course there is an optic challenge big also because we need to be able to dynamically control this resonance. But there is also this uh, some engineering challenge in terms of uh, electronics. So that's why we uh, we have groups uh, experts uh, both uh, in nanophotonics and in circuit design. Uh, in this project and then working together, we, we can solve these challenges and actually it really works. I, I would like to address your comment. I mean, of course, when you do it and you lap uh, yourself, like the, this uh, electrode array, which we did, right? So 28 electrodes, uh, that's kind of already create some problems with variance. So you need to use PCB. Now we did the same for uh, 100 electrodes, 96 electrodes. And again, uh, it, it's still possible, but it becomes more increasingly challenging. For example, if you would like to increase it to 500 electrodes, it already becomes a challenge. But uh, the good thing about it is that you don't need to do it because all the technology and silicon uh, circuits, they already exist. So basically you not just need to integrate everything on a, on a silicon wave on a sil and create a silicon circuitry, which will route all, all these electrodes. Same as they do for displays or any other pixelated array in, in conventional special light modulators, uh, they do the same. That's why I, I actually uh, don't foresee uh, a, any problems. So we already have devices now, which have uh, linear arrays of a thousand electrodes. And, and uh, uh, with um, two dimensional arrays, we have VGA resolution, so 640 by 480. So, and uh, we, we will be working on them quite soon. And actually already HD is also uh, is coming uh, a, a, a in the meantime, probably this year already. So this is, this is all, uh, the good thing about it is that we can use conventional and developed technologies to control our non-antennas. And that's what uh, the really big advantage. So we don't need to optimize it uh, ourselves or invent it ourselves, it's all there. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, well, this has been a fantastic story and thank you for uh, sharing it with us. Uh, so we're gonna move on now to our second talk for today. Um, and that is from uh, uh, Dr. Lei Shi uh, from Huazhong University of uh, Science and Technology. Uh, and he is gonna be uh, speaking to us today about uh, work on uh, realization of an on-ship non-reciprocal transmission by uh, mechanical Kerr effect. So also another active device. So Leishi, uh, maybe you can share, share the screen. So can you see my slide? Uh, yes, we can. Maybe you can uh, put it into full screen mode. There we go. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Edwarder and uh, the general team and Leishi from Huawei University of Science and Technology. So uh, this is my title of my talk. 
and this is the uh, outline of my talk. Uh, first, I will give an introduction to the background of the uh, on chip non critical uh, devices. Uh, breaking time reduction symmetry or re or RACI proof CCD is critical for uh, optical signal processing and the light source protection. Uh, magnetic magneto optical materials driven by uh, bas bas magnetic fields are usually used to construct non uh, reciprocal devices for free space optical and fiber optical uh, transmission systems. But their own chip integration has always been challenging, uh, primarily due to the high insertion loss, large footprint, and uh, material in compatibility. Therefore, it is imperative to find out the land uh, magnetic scans. Recently, on-chip land reciprocal uh, devices have been demonstrated by using brilliant scattering, spatial temporal modulations, cast three linear effect, thermal optical effect, and the PT symmetry structures. So uh, La Nina uh, language before devices can greatly uh, simplify for the fabrication steps as well as device design and operation. However, intrinsic uh, La Nina effects of materials are usually weak and thus a high operating, operating power of a uh, complex structure is always required to obtain a large land uh, reciprocal transmission ratio. A stronger land linear effect can reduce the power consumption, which is important for practical applications of on chip land uh, reciprocal transmission. In this work, we introduce the mechanical curve effect to realize passive or silicon low power consumption and the low insertion loss on chip non reciprocal devices. So uh, recently, an uh, extremely strong mechanical curve effect introduced by, induced by the optical gradient force gets increasing attention. The optical gradient force between the suspended waveguide and the su substrate can lead to the mechanical deformation of the waveguide. Owing to the deformation, the inflective index of the guiding mode change, which is called a mechanical curve effect. The mechanical curve coefficient can be several orders of mag magnitude larger than the conventional optical curve co coefficient, which means that the light field manipulation can be greatly enhanced. Due to the strong mechanical curve effect, the optical gradient forces have been used for uh, Bandboard phase shift, phase shifter, the tunable microrelator, the tunable directional coupler, uh, oblic switch, oblic storage, and the oblic line reciprocity. So, uh, in this week, we proposed and experimentally demonstrated on chip all passive low power consumption and the low use load in insert. In such a loss, uh, non reciprocal light transmission by using the mechanical curve effect based on an optical mechanical micro ring combined with the lossy component. The reciprocal device is based on the half released optical mechanical micro ring relator and a directional coupler, as shown in this is, is quick. The DC is treated as a lossy component. The device was fabricated in a 220 nanometer silicon on insulated vapor. First, the device is the device pattern was transferred to the boundary resist by EBL. Then the pattern was transferred to the silicon layer by ICB etching and the etching depth was 200 nanometer. Therefore, the rigid waveguide was fabricated. The second EBL and ICB processes was carried out to uh, form the re release window. And the uh, silica substrate in the window was exposed. The chip was co corroded by BOE subsequently, as shown in this figure. 
and uh, the <coughs> effective index is uh, inversely proportional to the gap. Therefore, the optional gradient force is attractive and it is inversely proportional to the gap as well. Due to the optical gradient force, the suspended waveguide will bend to the substrate and the effective index of the guiding mode increases. Therefore, the reasonable wavelength of the automatical micro ring is better shift compared with the light injected from the port two. The light is injected from port one. The uh, optical power is attenuated by the DC before coupling the uh, optical mechanic micro ring. Thus, the optical power in the optical micro ring as well as the uh, red shift of the reasonable wavelengths are smaller than those on condition that light is injected from port two. Since the strength of the nonlinear effects in the optical mechanical micro ring are dependent on the uh, trans transmission directions of light, so uh, the non reciprocal transmission is realized. So uh, the figure A to C uh, shows the forward and the backward transmission spectra at the different input powers respectively, and the figure D to F shows the Corresponding NTRs with well, the dots and the line represent the experiment and the theoretical results respectively. A uh, maximum uh, MPR of uh, of 23 dB with a low operating power of 251 megavolts and a low insertion loss of 2.3 uh, dB is realized. In the next step, the the land with spherical transmission probabilities are characterized by the independence of the uh, input power and uh, the input wavelengths. Figure A to C shows the forward and the backward transmission spectra with different wavelength detunions, respectively. And in the, in the experiments, the input power sweeps from low to high value with the tuning resolution of uh, this point to dBm. The corresponding NTRs are showing the uh, figure D to F, and uh, the maximum 10 dB operating power range is 2 dB. So, uh, as in indicated in the uh, experiment results, the device show low power consumption and large NTRs, but it is still constrained by small NPR. So uh, for land reciprocal devices based on a single nonlinear resonator, there exists a fundamental trade-off between the max, maximum forward transmission and MPR. The maximum uh, the maximum for the maximum NTR and the 10 dB MPR versus the insertion loss are shown in this in this figure. When the uh, insertion loss is higher than 255 dB. The 10 dB MPR reaches the maximum value of uh, 1.7 dB and the remains unchanged, which is limited by the low range line shape. However, due to the strong, due to the strong mechanical curve value and NTR of 21 dB with an insertion loss of this, this 0.5 dB and a, an operating power of 251 uh, megawatt can still be realized based on our device. To obtain the maximum 10 dB MPR and a low insertion loss, we fabricated the device with a notion of uh, 2.3 dB in this work. So uh, according to the uh, experimental results, the maximum dB and the MPR are un unchangeable for a complete device. So it is a Obvious that the NTR and the MPR are related to the loss induced by the loss, lossy component. Therefore, a tunable lossy component can improve the flexibility of uh, our device. So, uh, by electrically, electrically tuning the induced loss of the lossy component, the non reciprocal transmission bandwidth and the MPR can greatly burden it. Which is critical for uh, building reconfigurable and reciprocal devices. So, uh, to demonstrate that the mechanical curve effect is definitely dominant in our device, we designed a 
another ex experiment, we inject a probe light and a control light into the uh, optomagnetic magazine. The probe light is low power and the and uh, broadband, so that it can hardly co cause any uh, the linear effect, which is used to detect the change of the transmission spectrum. The control light is uh, high power and uh, one of chromatic, which is used to generate the mechanical curve effect and the uh, thermal effect. In this big, in figure A, we test the device correlated by VOE, in which there exists both the mechanical curve effect and the thermal effect. The input power of the control light is uh, 2.60 milliwatt. As the control light wavelength increases, the reasoned wavelength shift increases. When the uh, control light wavelength is 1555.44 uh, nanometer, a uh, maximum reasoned wavelength shift of 1.432 uh, nanometer is obtained. When the control light wavelength increases to uh, 1555.50 nanometer, the reasoned wavelength returns to the uh, initial position suddenly. We can simulate the experimental results as shown in this figure. The, uh, in the sections of the lines repre represent the steady states which can be obtained in, this, in our system. So uh, in addition, we test another device which is then correlated by VOE on the same chip. Therefore, only the uh, so the thermal effect can change the renal wavelength of this of our device. Manage, measure the transmission spectrum are shown in uh, in this figure. It is obvious that the uh, mechanical current effect is significantly stronger than the uh, thermal effect and the same uh, input power. However, silicon silicon is much better uh, thermal conductor than silicon and uh, air. When the waveguard is suspended, the heat induced by light is better confirmed in the uh, optimal mechanical magazine and uh, contributes to the uh, thermal effect more efficiently. Since we cannot experimentally study the uh, thermal effect of the uh, corrigated device separately based on the same device, so we should to we should prove this conclusion uh, theoretic, theoretically. In order to study the uh, the heat dispersion characteristics of the uh, silicon magazine, we perform a 3D thermal simulation by using COMSOL. The steady state distribution of the uh, temperature change of the magazine is shown in Big C and uh, Big D. The absorption co coefficient of device can be calculated based on the experiment result in Fig A and by substituting the thermal conductive, conductivity of the metal of the co corrigated magazine and the uh, absorption coefficient to to these equations, we can simulate the thermal effect of the uh, corrigated magazine. So, uh, as shown in this uh, in this figure, the red line is. Uh, the transmission spectral considering both the mechanical curve effect and the thermal effect. And the black line is the uh, transmission spectral only considering the former. When the uh, input power is 251 megawatts, obviously the transmission spectral are nearly identically. So which means that the thermal effect is extremely weak and can be uh, negative, can be uh, Neglected when we uh, study the uh, non reciprocal uh, transmission in, in, in our devices. So, okay, uh, finally, we come to the conclusion. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Leishi, for this very uh, intriguing talk about uh, non reciprocal. Uh, devices, which is a very uh, interesting subject. And uh, so I think you also addressed probably what is the, the, the what would be the largest concern for people about uh, such a device, which has, has to do with its thermal effects. 
And when you were speaking about the thermal effect, were you describing a thermal effect that is due to the change in optical power in the waveguide? Or was it due to a thermal fluctuation of the temperature of the whole chip, independent of the optical power in the waveguide? Um, in other words, is the thermal uh, change coming from the optical uh, uh, power? No, uh, the thermal effect due to the absorption of the silicon, of the silicon. Okay, yeah. Yeah. All right. So due to the, uh, the absorption, yeah, increase the absorption. Okay. And so then your design uh, of the chip is designed in such a way to maximize the, uh, I guess the thermal conductivity of your resonator so that you don't have a big uh, temperature excursion of the, of the resonator then. Yeah. And um, yeah. you know, according to this, this big, we can right. Uh, yeah, that looks like a quite a nicely uh, temperature stabilized structure. Okay, great. Um, well, I think yeah, we're we're now uh, at our time here. So we'll uh, uh, thank you for this uh, um, you know exciting talk, a short talk, uh, and this is uh, of course a paper that was recently uh, um, uh, gone online in uh, ACS Photonics, and uh, so the audience can uh, refer to the details there. So I, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, close the webinar for today and uh, thank both speakers, uh, Arseny Kuznetsov and Lei Shi for joining us uh, and look forward to seeing uh, everyone next time.